lot of times if you're like raised in church and you hear a message like this, it's kind of like last week, like, well, that's a lot of touchy-feely, but it is very gospel-oriented. If you don't go to New Life, normally the way I like to teach is just verse by verse through the Bible. That's just how I like to do it. We're taking a little break here. Next week, Pastor Jack, while I'm in Australia, Pastor Jackson will be speaking. So it's, it's 16 hours ahead there. We'll pass 18 time zones. We lose a day and we leave and then we land at the same time, right? That's our, I'm going to be here Thanksgiving. Like, we're, or what are we doing here? We get back to never for Thanksgiving, but, um, but so we're going to go do that. I'm excited about what God, but I would rather, like, I love doing verse by verse. Pastor Jackson's going to do a great job, but I knew the Lord wanted me to speak on this. So just know this, that I am a hundred percent a guy, if you, anybody, if you're new to new life, you won't know this. If you've been new life, I mean, we preach the full counsel of scripture. I believe if the Bible calls it sin, we call it sin. We're never going to condone sin. So if you're like, that was a little bit of like an interesting way to present this today, just know, and I'll talk about it a little bit, but this isn't like carte blanche, just live any way you want. I'm talking about your response today. So let's talk about one more week on compassion. Then we're going to go through the life of Jesus it's all good. Are we all good? Are we good? Are we good? Okay, okay, okay. If you want to show your pastor some compassion, saying amen every once in a while and staying awake, those two things right there, we are good to go. I've said it before. If you could see some of the things I see while I'm preaching, you would die laughing. So... Like some of you, it's incredible. You read your Bible on your phone all 30 minutes of my messages. It's like, you're so immersed in scripture. It's inc- How you do that, I don't even know. Let's talk about the Bible. <laughs> the theology of compassion. What is the theology of compassion? Like we could talk about the feelings of compassion, but theology of compassion in Christianity, Christianity centers on the belief that compassion is not just a moral virtue, but it is a literal reflection of God's own nature and a key aspect of the life of Christ. When we act in compassion, we aren't just, oh, it's the right thing to do. We are actually a reflection of what God would have us to be. That is the theology of compassion. There's this, there's this, word, right, um, that is, is an incredible, the meaning here is a lot, and it's a, a magio day. Now, in English, the word is the image of God. In Genesis 1, we read in Genesis 1, 27, that all of us are created in the image of the God. This concept actually connects us with this simple Thing that implies this, that everyone is created in the image of God. So every human has inherent worth, dignity, and value. Everyone that is created as a human is created in the image of God. Compassion, therefore, is an acknowledgement of this dignity in others. Even in the ones that are marginalized, even in the ones that are suffering, even in the ones that are different than you, that look different than you, live a different lifestyle than you, they deserve the the dignity to realize that they are created in the image of God and they have the same intrinsic value that you do. No one has less value than you do. See, it's easy in this stuff, and we're going to read a a parable here. The easiest thing to do is if I marginalize someone, I don't have to care for someone. They're different. So I remove myself from them and then I don't have to worry about them. That's exactly what Jesus is trying to deal with here in Luke chapter 10. You know this, you've heard this. This is not a new parable. It's 12 verses. We're gonna start where we were last week and then we're gonna go through a little more. Jesus is teaching here, and he begins to teach him on one occasion, right? We talked about this last week, an expert of the law, which is hilarious, because an expert of the law is trying to stump the person who is the law, the embodiment of the law. Could you imagine? Again, I said it last week, it's like when your kids are like challenging you, and you're like, I made you. Don't you dare question me. Jesus did not come, by the way, to do away with the law. Jesus came to be a perfect fulfillment embodiment of the law. So the expert in the law stood up to test Jesus' teacher. He asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
What is written in the law? He replied, is what's in the word, right? What's in the word? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. He's doing good so far. But really, here's what he's trying to do. He wanted to justify himself. He obviously wasn't treating people very good. And he wanted Jesus to tell him, yo, it's all good. And who is my neighbor? Now, in reply, Jesus said a man was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And when he was attacked, he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by the other side. Most scholars believe the reason the priest would have, because it would have been ceremonially ceremonially unclean to touch someone that was bleeding. By the way, could you imagine going to do church that you don't even stop to be the church? Yeah, you're overwhelmed, I could tell. Um, So too, a Levite, worshipers, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan, This is scandalous. The hero of the story is a Samaritan. I'll share with you in a minute. That is like, now their mind is going, this is impossible. Right? This would be like, like, you know, you know, a Raiders fan is the hero of this story. Nah, I'm joking. They're, They're no threat. As he traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went and bandaged his wounds and pouring in oil, on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey. He brought him to an end and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which is their form of money. And he gave them to the innkeeper looking after him. He said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any and extra expense you have. And then he goes on to say, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, good, why don't you go try some of it? Why don't you try a little bit of that? Why don't you show a little bit of mercy? Why don't you show a little bit of grace? The real question he was asking, honestly, wasn't who is my neighbor? He really wanted to know, who can I view as not my neighbor? Who could you resolve me from? And you know who he was hoping? He probably would have said a Samaritan. And then Jesus is like, ding, ding, we're going to make the Samaritan the hero of the story. Jesus has a way of stepping into our comfortable lives and saying, maybe not. You ever feel like that? Like, man, I, 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 nope. Jesus doesn't follow our own trends. He sees something differently. The question starts it all. Who is my neighbor? This is the question we're going to answer today. Right, the lawyer approaches Jesus and he asks him, like, what must I do? And Jesus answers with a question. Asking what is written in the law, right? He's asking him, like, what do you do? Jesus says, love the Lord your God. But then he pushes further. Who is my neighbor? This question is crucial because it reflects the human tendency to create boundaries around who deserves our compassion. Like, he, he, he's like, we all do it. Like we all do it. We all have things that we do, things that we say, people we try to exclude. But Jesus responds to this question is not with a simple answer, but with a story that radically redefines what it means to be a neighbor. Let's notice what Jesus didn't do. He didn't say, what does your synagogue say? What does your rabbi say? What does your pastor say? What does your denomination say? Instead, Jesus asked him, what does the word of God say? Let me help you today. I don't, I'm not really concerned with what you think. I'm more concerned with what the word says. Let's have a starting point at the word. And I promise you, it'll change things. The word, the word, the word. Your opinion is incredible. And I'm sure you think it's awesome, just like I do. When I have an opinion on something, I just assume everyone wants to know it. But in the end, I'm less concerned about your opinion and I'm more concerned about your faith. Like, what does the word have to say? Church, you want to change this world? They don't need to know your opinion. They need to know how much you know the word. By the way, John 1 1 says, Jesus is the word. Do we know the word? Do you know Jesus? Do you know the written word? Do you know the rhema word? Right? Like, do you understand who he is? 
Jesus shows the lawyer that he's asking the wrong question. The question isn't who is my neighbor, what's the right thing to believe? Instead, he should be asking this, how can I be a good neighbor and how can I live out my own belief? Do you know these two go hand in hand? I can't live out my belief if I'm not treating the people around me. By the way, the neighbor is not the person next door to you. Scripturally, your neighbor is the people you pass all the time. How can he be a good neighbor, right? No, how can I live out my faith? How can I make sure that my beliefs are evident? The first lesson we see from this story is Jesus exposing a cultural touch point. Let me mess with some of y'all a little bit today. If you have emails, you don't like what I'm getting ready to say, please let me know, all right? Jackson at New Life, NLCKC.com. Because this is going to mess with some of you a little bit today. Someone after the service is like, I kind of needed to hear that. But let's talk about why they hated the Samaritans. Let's talk about what it looks like today. The first lesson we could see from this story is this. Jesus is exposing something here. They still have a really bad case of racism. It was culturally accepted. And the reason they, Jews hated the Samaritans is, ra- is this. By the way, that's still the story, of the, the hero of the story. The story began when Solomon was king and his son Rehoboam succeeded him. During his reign, God's kingdom in Israel became divided again. And the Assyrians began to oppress them. Many of the Jews were like, hey, the Assyrian culture, they took on the Assyrian culture and they ended up marrying them, which over hundreds of years led to many people who were both half Jew and half Gentile. Because of this, the people developed a prejudice against the Samaritans because of their race and because of their background and because they just viewed them as, they literally called them half-breeds. Yet in this parable, the Samaritan is the one who tends to the men's wounds. Jesus wants to illustrate that our neighbor is anyone in need. He's dignifying the worth of the Samaritans and the people of different races and different everything than us. He was actually giving them value. While this cultural significance was literal to them, I think it's a lesson we can still apply to our modern perspectives and standings. It hurts my heart when I hear Christians and people that know better say like, well, in America, there's no such thing as racism anymore. That is flat out a lie from hell. It's a fact. It is, it is, it, there is no opinion on this. I'm not here to give you statistics, but I promise I could give you many statistics from incarceration to people being pulled over to people of color face things that we don't. And I'll give you an, an example. Give you an example. I didn't do this in the first service, but I don't know. I just, we had a young man that I love dearly. And he, he, he knows, I've, he, I've told him, I'm, I'm going to share this in church where he's at, go for it. And TJ Tajani Khalifala Jackson. You can probably guess his skin color. Huh? He's my guy, I love TJ. And he came to live with us. And uh, we, were, we were out one day, we we're getting gas. And we went into a gas station in, in uh, Blue Springs, Lee Summit area. And we were just walking through the store. Nobody paid us mine. And I watched two employees follow. This is a year ago, two years ago, whatever. Three or four years ago. <laughs> Woo, I'm getting old. And uh, I, 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 I watched multiple employees follow him around the store like he's getting ready to steal something. And I asked him, but he's like, I'm just so used to that. It doesn't even cross my mind anymore. It's just everywhere I go. I'm just so used to it. So I said, get in the car. I'll be right back. So I go walk in the store and I'm like, how dare you? How dare you treat someone like that and follow him around like that? You should be absolutely ashamed of yourself. And I realized that that was just a reality of life for TJ. I don't say that today to be like, we haven't made strides, and I, but we got to wake up and realize that as, as soon as we marginalize someone for their skin color or their sexual orientation, or we, we, we throw titles on them like illegal immigrants. What is, listen, I get it. This is not a, I'm zero political in this message today. Zero. 
Let's let the politicians politish. I just made up that word. And let's let the church be the church. We got to stop marginalizing people because they're different than us and they look different than us. Sure, sin is sin and we can let the Holy Spirit convict of sin. But our job is to love. And just like the Samaritan stopped for somebody he had no business stopping for, who do we think we are to put value on different people and undervalue other people? That is not the gospel and it has no place in the kingdom of God. I'm not getting on my soul. I promise I'm not here to preach at you or down at you because can I be honest with you today? I struggle with some prejudice in my life still. And there's things that the Holy Spirit is working on me on. And I, I, just, I find myself still looking down on certain people and viewing certain people differently. And guess what? That is wrong and it's sinful. And I need to repent too. And I need to do better. And I need to view people like the Bible views people because we need to treat everyone with dignity and respect. Treating all people with dignity, regardless of skin color and nationality or sexuality or what you think is wrong. But treating them with dignity is rooted in the gospel. This is what the gospel is all about. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. While you had no hope, Jesus ran to the cross for you. Everybody has that same value. Jesus doesn't create junk. We are created in the image of God. Let's stop looking down on people and start reaching down to everyone. And by the way, we don't have to reach down because someone is lower than us. I'm reaching equal because they're the same as me. Amen. Right? Are we good today? Are we all on the same team? Now I got to move really fast. I have a few minutes left. The lawyer in this text, he, this is probably my second favorite part of the message. Probably my favorite part. Because now I'm really going to mess with some of my peoples. Right? The lawyer in this text differs from a profession that you would say is like a lawyer. This is a Pharisee whose expertise oh, was in the Old Testament law. To be a Pharisee, you want to know what you had to do? Have the Old Testament memorized. Did you know that most Jewish kids, by the time they were 12, had the Torah memorized? And I'm begging my kids to get off their PlayStation, not mine, because we don't do that in my house. But, right, like, just can you, can you, right? So we've lowered the bar a lot, right? But the, this guy knew the law. He knew, watch this, he knew its applications. He knew the enforcement. The parable illustrates a professor of the Old Testament law and a Levite. They were literally in charge of worship. Now we go to a priest who displays a heartless religion. For these two that knew better, it had become mechanical and operational. So in this parable, two people who would have had a reputation for being strong in the Lord become cold and indifferent to the truth when there's a man beaten on the side of the road. I said it earlier. They literally passed being the church to go to church. They literally were so good at doing church that they lost sight of what it meant to be the church. Jesus illustrates that a person can outwardly be religious, but inwardly cold and empty. I'll tell you, I, the people that I think is the hardest to come back is not the hardened sinner. It's a person that knows better and chooses to be religious instead of have a relationship with Jesus. This should be a warning to all of us. It's possible to make church a process of going through the motions without truly surrendering our hearts to Jesus. Instead of thinking about who we get to worship, we make it about where we go to worship and the style in which we worship. Whew. I promise you Jesus isn't in heaven being like, well, that style's better, and I like that song because it's from the 60s better. Well, that's out of a hymn book. I like that better. And that, no, it long, the Bible says if we'll lift him up, he'll draw people to him. So as long as the songs are about Jesus, they can be from 1892, 1992, 2032. I, I, it doesn't matter. Do they lift up Jesus? Are we lifting up Jesus in this place? Your style is incredible. We all have preferences. That, your preferences are not wrong. But that's not the main thing. He's the main thing. And when we keep the main thing the main thing, good things happen. All right? I'm ready to preach today, but I'm running out of time. It's easy, though. Now, here we go. This, 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 this is where I got challenged. It's easy to read this story and look down on the lawyer. 
But this story should be as a mirror to examine ourselves. Am I more like the lawyer or the good Samaritan? Am I being a good neighbor? It's easy to quickly answer that question, but Jesus' story forces us to actually examine our lives to see for ourselves. Because you want to go to the next level of this? Later on in the parable, Jesus says, oh, by the way, it's not just enough to love your neighbor. You need to bless your enemy. No. Why? Because Jesus understands in this story, the Samaritan is the enemy of the Jews. Jesus shows that the requirement or the invitation is to have such a vibrant and loving relationship with God that you have the heart of God for all people, which includes your enemies. By the way, this is impossible without Jesus. It's an impossibility. By the way, some of us have made enemies of people that have no business being your enemy just because they vote different than you or look different. That's, that's, that's different than the enemy. That's different. That is you putting labels on people. But there are some people in your life, let me be honest today, and I said it in the first service. I, I don't want to say this today and be like, well, you know, you just have to let everyone back in your life. There are some people that could hurt you in a way that they have disqualified their right to play a vital part in your life. But that doesn't mean that we wish poorly on them. We just have to say, for me in my life, I need to kind of separate from this. And by the way, we're heading into the holiday season. Oh, I, should, I, I said I wasn't going to say in this service that I'm going to. Are we, are we, is this a safe place? You don't have to invite family members over that are toxic and are, are like that, that, that kind of that what, creepy uncle that gets invited and makes all the girls uncomfortable. Let's not invite him to the holidays. Because they're making decisions. That's just not very scriptural. I shouldn't say this. But like Am I wrong? And I, well, they're family. Well, yeah, but they make decisions that they don't disqualify themselves to be part of the family, but maybe to be around the family as much. And if you're like, man, my family doesn't have any crazy people in it. <laughs> if you're like, I can't even think of one. I bet they can. But uh, because here's the thing. Here's where I love and worship team. You could come back. I told you I wasn't going to be very long today. Here's where it becomes about, let's make it back to us. Every follower of Jesus has an enemy. It's true. And he even encourages us to beware what everyone, he even says, by the way, be careful if everyone loves you. The Bible says the world will hate us if we stand for the gospel. So just because there are people that doesn't like you, it doesn't always mean you've done something wrong. It might mean the opposite. You actually might be standing for truth that makes them uncomfortable. That's different than making enemies for other things. Everybody good on that? That's the difference. But love also, I want to say this again, does not mean approve or even engage with. But it does mean I don't want bad things to happen to you. But this parable points to a, even a deeper reality. The Samaritans... They were despised. He was rejected by man. Scripture reminds us today what? That we were dead in our trespass and sins. Separated from God. Yet Jesus, like the Samaritan, pursued us. Are you ready for some of the most incredible scriptures? They didn't amen this enough in the first service. And I got a little ticked off at him. If you can't amen what I'm getting ready to read, let's shut it down and go do something. Let's go sit in a deer stand. I pray curse over no deer bosses in front of your son. You couldn't shoot it anyway. We're friends, we're friends. Here we go. Ephesians, here we go. As for you, that isn't talking about the person next to you. So as for me, read it like this. As for me, I, I was dead in my transgression and sins in which you, oh, here we go, in which I used to live. When I followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the earth, that's Satan, by the way, the spirit who is now at work, and but leave this here. Um, I'm sorry, go back. Those who are disobedient. By the way, this shows the, the devil is not some little cute cartoon character. Here's real power. And we need to acknowledge your spiritual warfare happening around us in the world. And we need to take a stand, Ephesians 6, against the schemes of the devil. Okay, here we go. Go on, verse three. Oh, You guys are fun to preach to today. I'll be honest, first service, a little dry, a little dry. <laughs> All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the desires of my flesh and following his desires and thoughts. Like the rest, I, by my nature, deserving of wrath. You deserve wrath. 
Now let's make it about the star of the show. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, right, made us alive with Christ. Even when I was dead in my transgressions, it is by grace that you, I have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus. Come on. In order. What? Why? That the coming ages might show the comparable riches of his grace express in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace. Not you, not your works, not your goodness, not your awesomeness. It is by grace, through faith, that is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God and not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. A new command, right? For we are God's hand. A new command I give you. Let's go. I'm going to finish this. Now I'm switching Bible first. We're going to John 13 because I want to say this. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you so that you must love one another. Here's why. This is how everyone's going to know that we're followers of Jesus. Do we truly love one another? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God created us to live a better life. But you also want to understand this. There was no obvious benefit for the good Samaritan to help the fallen man. Just like there was no benefit for God to step down and save me. Our human nature makes it more willing to be inconvenienced if there's something in it for us. But there was nothing in it for God and he chose us. God created us to live a better story. To actually make an impact on someone. But we can only do that when we live generously, when we give rather than take, when we put others' needs above our own. So I just pray God is going to speak to us today as I, I'm done. And uh, I don't know about you, like I was so challenged doing this, like even giving it today. Like I, I don't like to speak in terms of you got to do better or you're worse because those are arbitrary, but I need to do better in the way that I love people. And I've realized I can't just wish it. I have to pray and I have to study the word and God will change my heart if I let him do it. Today, what is God speaking to you? I want to pray over you, please. And God, we thank you for this incredible day. What an, what an awesome day. Tens of thousands of dollars raised to reach people for Jesus get to hear about how much you love us. But God, I know there's people in this room today that sin has separated them from you. And we need, a, we need repentance in this place. We don't just need a neat little prayer of God, forgive me. We need to repent. Repentance means to change. And God, there are people in this room today that need to make things right with you and no one looking around if you're here today. We don't do this because we're ashamed. We do this because it's personal. And then you can respond. But if you're here today and there's sin in your life, and you need to make things right with Jesus. Come on, you can be feeling convicted today. I see hands being raised already. Would you just slip a hand up today? Wow. That's incredible. You can put your hands down. If you raise your hand, would you talk to someone? If you know a strong believer, we can help you for sure. Talk to a pastor, just talk to a friend. It's important that you begin the steps to Jesus. Nobody's in here alone. Nobody found Jesus on their own. I promise you that. And you don't need to find him alone. Let, let us help you. We want to walk with you. Here's what we're going to do. If we can just stand to our feet. And also every service at New Life, we pray one for another. We believe in the laying on of hands of people. We still believe in healing. We believe that God can restore. We believe that God can heal from that diagnosis, restore your marriage, help your children. God can move in your finances. If you need a miracle today, you're in the right place. I'm going to pray. The prayer team is going to come forward. I want you to respond. And Janessa is going to lead us in a song. I'm going to be honest. That's why the place was still packed when you got here because the Holy Spirit fell in altar time and it went like for a while. So I'm not, that only God can do this. I'm not saying that's going to happen here, but there was an anointing of God in this place during this altar time last service. So I want you to respond. God, would you move in this place? If we need a miracle, let us have the courage. If we need to be encouraged, if we need to change our heart, if we need to repent, let us respond today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.